well, this is one of the nicest ways I've spent a Tuesday morning in a while. <laughs> Just <laughs> sitting in the woods looking at rocks. Hey there! So this is a new kind of video for me. I am super excited about it. I even broke out the fancy bow shirt and I think you're gonna learn a lot and I hope you enjoy it. So kick back, relax, and let's jump in. Hey there! Right now I'm in Houghton, Michigan. Specifically, I'm on the campus of Michigan Tech University, and I'm here to see a boulder that is kind of dramatically out of place. I first saw this thing when I was here back in May, and while it totally piqued my curiosity, I had no idea what kind of adventure I was about to go on. Hello, old friend. So this boulder doesn't look like much, but what caught my attention the first time I saw it wasn't the rock itself, but the sign next to it. According to the sign, this boulder was collected from near Marquette, which is a city about 70 miles from here as the crow flies. But that's not where this thing started. In reality, the material that makes up a lot of this boulder was blasted over to Marquette at supersonic speeds from Sudbury, Ontario, some 300 miles away. Turns out, about 1.8 billion years ago, there was an enormous meteorite impact near Sudbury, one so large it blasted debris as far as modern-day Minnesota. And also, it might have changed the composition of the nearby oceans. I had never heard of this thing, so I immediately got online and started researching. Except, in trying to read up on this topic, I quickly realized that I was getting out of my depth. There was enough context and backstory that I risked getting the facts seriously wrong if I tried to dive in on my own. So, I got some help. Meet Dr. Bill Cannon. He's a scientist emeritus with the U.S. Geological Survey and might be one of the coolest people I've ever met. Back in May, I kept seeing his name pop up in papers about the Sudbury impact, so I reached out and asked if he'd maybe be willing to do a video call to answer a few of my questions. Turns out, he was going to be in Marquette in September, so a few months after that initial email, we met up at this little, unassuming roadside park about 15 minutes outside the city, and I learned so much. Like, here's something you need to know about Dr. Cannon. When I say he's an expert in Marquette geology, that's almost an understatement. Check it out. Bill, how are you? How are you doing this morning? I, I'm fine. <laughs> it's a cool, uh, somewhat damp morning, but, it is. but we're used to that kind of thing around here. So I feel like in the very short amount of time I've talked to you, I, I just get the impression of like, do you know more about geology in Marquette than anyone, or am I just hyping you up too much? Um, I'm probably well up the list <laughs> okay. because I've, I've actually started working here 54 years ago. Yeah. And uh, I've done many other things. I don't want to imply I've been here for 54 years. Sure. But Marquette and the Lake Superior area in general has been one of the focuses of my career. So it's, it's I've, I've, yeah, I know, how would I say it? Quite a lot, <laughs> more, more than most people about the geology here, so. So Bill knows his stuff, and among other things, I got to chat with him about how our understanding of the Sudbury impact has changed in the 54 years he's been studying this area. But first, here's some of the backstory he helped me understand. So about 1.8 billion years ago, there wasn't any big life on Earth. Most things were tiny, like phytoplankton. These organisms were hanging out in seas around the planet, and some of them were producing oxygen through photosynthesis. Overall, it was just a cool time in Earth's history, and the planet was getting closer and closer to the place we recognize today. But then, one day, a rock came screaming in from space. And it wasn't just any rock, this one was the size of a small city. A good, good reasonable assumption is that the impacting body was between 10 and 15 kilometers in diameter. Wow. Uh, which is a big, big hunk of rock. Yeah. And of course, again, another important factor in the amount of energy transmitted into the earth is how fast it was moving. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, the amount of energy in an object is proportional to its mass times its velocity squared. Okay, yep. And the velocity is the thing we know the least about. Okay. So <laughs> you can understand there's, there's a, big, uh, a big range of estimates. Uh, the crater itself, has been estimated on the small side to be 150 kilometers diameter, and on the large side, 250. So okay. it's reasonable to think about it as something like a 200 kilometer diameter hole blasted in the ground and, and excavated down to perhaps 30 or 35 kilometers. Wow. Now, today you won't see like a giant pit at Sudbury. There's been a lot of erosion and other activity over the last 1.8 billion years. But regardless, that former crater isn't the only thing this impact left behind. It also flooded the surrounding area with debris, so much so that it formed a new rock layer more than 130 feet thick 
nearly 300 miles away. But before we get into that, what really struck me about this story was the fact that for a long time, geologists didn't think there was an impact here. See, Sudbury is a major nickel mining district, so by the 1960s, people had been doing geological work there for a century. But even then, they just thought there was some weird volcanic rock there. That is, until a scientist named Bob Dietz came along. Today, Dietz is more well known for his work in oceanography and plate tectonics, but in the early 1960s, he published a paper with this wild idea that those rocks at Sudbury were thanks to an impact. He based his hypothesis on the existence of shatter cones in some of the rocks, which he interpreted as evidence for a meteorite impact. And well, let's just say that idea was not received super well. When you first started in this area, what was the state of knowledge like? Well, that was, I started here in 1967. This is almost my 54th anniversary. Yeah. Just a few days ago. All right. Uh, and in terms of the Sudbury impact, uh, it was a very new, a very controversial idea. At that time, hardly anybody believed it. Uh, people had been studying the geology of Sudbury for literally a century because it's a major mining district. Mm. And uh, uh, an American oceanographer named Bob Dietz after spending a few days at Sudbury, suggested that this was probably a meteor impact based on some unique features that he saw there. And he was viewed as a heretic, just absolutely out of his, out of his mind. But pretty quickly, some other people began to find other evidence that, yeah, maybe this was an impact. Mm -hmm. And over all that time, you know, 50 years or more, uh, it's become almost universally accepted that, that much of the geology at Sudbury, including the major nickel deposits, mm. were created by this giant impact event. In fact, it's interesting that, that uh, the city of Sudbury is there because of the nickel deposits, mm -hmm. and the nickel deposits are there because of the Sudbury impact. Kind of an interesting uh, uh, illustration of how events in the way back geologic past can still have an effect on, yeah. on what's going on today. Now, I mentioned that Bill and I met up at this little roadside park outside of Marquette, and that wasn't just for kicks. This roadside park is also home to the McClure site, which is the best place in Michigan to see the wreckage the Sudbury impact left behind. And what I was curious about was how geologists knew what they were looking at here in the first place. But of course, Bill had me covered. This is one of the latter ones that we had recognized. Okay. Uh, although it was mapped in the early 60s. In fact, I, I first saw this site with a colleague in 1967. All right. And yeah. he, he had mapped it and uh, he showed me this funny breccia and we agreed that's a, a funny breccia. All right. <laughs> Actually, some colleagues in Canada had recognized the layer up there in, in near, near Thunder Bay. Okay, sure. And they showed us what it looked like and we immediately thought, oh yeah, we know where that is in Michigan. When we first looked at it, we were not very certain that it really was ejecta. Sure. Uh, but the sort of the smoking gun of uh, identifying, proving something is meteor ejecta is something called uh, shocked quartz. Okay. And this is uh, sort of sand grains of quartz, a common mineral, uh, that has been uh, received such a strong shock wave that it's made changes in the crystallographic structure cool. that, you, that is quite easily to see under a microscope. If you don't find that, uh, the skeptics will never believe that you have a meteor <laughs> impact, so, but it's, so that, that's critical to find. Yeah. And we, we did eventually find it here, and, and, and it, was, it was a slam dunk that this is really part of the, cool. the ejected material from Sudbury. Neat. And then, of course, came my favorite part of the morning. Well, on that note, want to go look at some rocks? Let's look at rocks. All right. That's what I do. <laughs> All right, into the woods we go. That's probably the, the best piece to see All features right. in. You want to scramble over there and... Yeah, I feel, part of me, I'm just like, it's a rock. I can sit on it, but there's a part of me that's like, but it's a significant rock. <laughs> that's all right. Well, this is one of the nicest ways I've spent a Tuesday morning in a while. <laughs> Just sitting in the woods looking at rocks. What are we looking at? Okay, well, we'll take a closer look at some of the material that makes up this uh, layer of impact-related rocks. And uh, there's a general term called ejecta for these kind of rocks. It simply means material that's been ejected forcefully out of the crater by the, by the impact blast. So in here, we can see these, and we refer to this in a, also a general term as breccia. Okay. We can see these large angular fragments. 
of lighter colored rock. And these are most likely derived from the rock layer immediately uh, beneath this ejecta material. As the material came over, it, it ripped up some of that material and incorporated it into, into this. Wow. Hard to see uh, on this, but you can see some little indentations, pits all over this. Mm -hmm. And they are little fragments of uh, what was glassy material. Okay. And this was material that was not just physically broken, uh, expelled from the crater, but was heated so much by the impact energy that it melted and it came out as, as little particles of uh, basically lava. And they, they have, again, blown 500 kilometers to here and uh, make up a, a good deal of the, the finer grain material on here. So this is quite typical of what the rock here at McClure looks like. Okay. There are many different ways in which you can uh, form an ejecta layer. And this is one that we interpret to be what we call a, a ground surge. Okay. That means that the solid rocks that are blown from the crater come on ballistic arcs at supersonic velocities. And when they hit the earth, uh, if you throw a rock today, it, it doesn't hit and stop. It hits and skips and moves on not because of its own momentum. And that's what our interpretation is of this. So this was great mass of rock coming on ballistic arcs, hitting the earth at supersonic velocities and then kind of screaming across the earth's surface and tearing up everything that it came in contact with until it finally slowed down and, and settled out in a layer that here is about 40, uh, 40 meters thick. Wow. So it's a very thick layer and it seems to be all just one event. It's just right now you had 40, 40 meters of new rock here. Yeah, and that would have been a, a fast process, right? Yeah. Like, a, you know, Wednesday, you've got what it was banded iron formation right, was the layer right, here. Right. Yeah, Wednesday you've got banded iron formation and then what, Thursday, Friday? Yeah, New well this, this probably takes, uh, this would have arrived only minutes after the impact. Oh, <laughs> well then, okay. You know, it's coming out at, at some kilometers per second, so there's yeah. not that many kilometers between between here and Sudbury. So it gets here in a hurry okay. and settles out in a hurry. So it's it's perhaps only, only minutes. Whew. This kind of blew my mind, just thinking about how fast this region of the Earth changed. Like, the day before the impact, the sediments that were being laid down here created a rock layer called banded iron formation. It's kind of stripy and it formed in the seas or oceans. Bill shows me some in the next clip. But then this impact comes along and suddenly, no more banded iron formation. This rock never forms in this region again. So what happened? It seems like something about the composition of the ocean drastically changed, definitely in this region and possibly on a global scale. Maybe it was some kind of extinction event where a bunch of phytoplankton disappeared, or maybe it was something else. We just don't know yet. Oh, and also, we haven't even talked about the earthquake. So as we look at a, a rock face like this, we're seeing the oldest rocks here getting younger, younger, younger as we go up. These rocks here, you can sort of see a layered structure in, mm -hmm. is the top of a banded iron formation. Okay. Bit of a close up, not, not real clear, but you can see this lighter greenish layer is a chert layer. And then these other units are more iron rich units. Okay, yeah. So these are called banded iron formations because they're, it, they're bands of Churdy rock, iron rock, churdy rock, iron rock. These were the last layers of iron formation that were being deposited uh, before the impact event. If we look at this material here, we can see that there are see pieces of chert, these lighter bands, but they're not continuous layers and they're not in place. They've been broken apart and jumbled around a bit. And our interpretation of this is that this breaking apart was created first by the enormous earthquake that was set off okay. by the Sudbury impact. Uh, by some estimates, it could have been a magnitude 11 earthquake, which is greater than any earthquake you can create on Earth. So the, when the earthquake arrived here, it actually broke apart some of this iron formation into small fragments and kind of jostled them around. Uh, they were stacked up with open spaces. And then when the ejector arrived, it actually sort of filtered down in and filled in these spaces. Okay. And then as we go this way and it's successively younger, we get less chert although there's still quite a bit. Up here, for instance, we can again see these angular fragments, which are pretty clearly derived from this material here, oh, yeah. but they're a little more transported. They're, they're now floating in this matrix of glassy ejecta material. Okay. 
So you've got this story where a rock comes screaming in from space, hits what's now Ontario, and creates a whole new rock layer in Marquette, Michigan, and beyond. And along the way, it might have also, you know, changed the composition of the oceans. One question I had for Bill is what geologists are still trying to learn from this site. And partly, he mentioned that they're now trying to use this Sudbury layer to better understand the iron deposits around Michigan's Upper Peninsula. But also, there's this. And I think a bigger question, and I'm we were a little disappointed that nobody has has followed up on this. Is there really a mass extinction that mm -hmm. has changed? Mm -hmm. what, what happened that changed the the way the the, the sediments that the ocean was depositing the day before and the day after the impact? That's a really big change yeah. in what the ocean was doing, and we don't have a very good explanation for for that yet. Sure. So I think there's a, a, a very fruitful area for research on that. Cool. Open for anybody that wants to do that. Open for anybody who wants to do that, he says. <laughs> so if you're looking for a thesis idea, there you go. Now, I learned so much from Bill, but one last question I love to ask people as we're wrapping up is that if somebody takes away one thing from this conversation, what should that thing be? So as we wind down the story of the Sudbury impact, I'll leave you with one more clip. One that's not just about the rocks, but is also about the ordinary, incredible people who've helped us understand them. Oh, I think um, you have to be open to a totally new idea. Yeah. You know, we, 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 people thought they understood this for a long time and they were, you know, it was totally, totally wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, so be open to that and, and um, don't get, don't get too uh, um, focused in on traditional interpretations. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you didn't have a little bit, bit of an open mind, you know, we would have just gone past this. And, and, uh, yeah. and so actually the, the people that discovered this, it's a little, little interesting side story. In, in Thunder Bay, there were two retired high school teachers huh. who had no geologic experience whatsoever. Uh, Greg uh, Brumpton and Bill Addison were their names. Okay. Uh, but they were had a lot of curiosity and they had read about the Chicxulub impact. Mm -hmm. And they re realized that in Thunder Bay, there's a situation where there's um, a rock unit that is full of algal stromatolites. Okay, yeah. And it's got a black slate right above it. Oh. So, the th so they theorized maybe this was related to the Sudbury impact. Mm -hmm. And they spent about 10 years of their own time wow. trying to find this, learning more about geology, and finally uh, found it and, and proved that it was the impact. Oh. So that was really the first. Uh, uh, discovery, and that, that, that's what led to you know, ourselves and other people uh, being able to, to find this around the Lake Superior region. So that was a pretty remarkable story, those yeah. two, two, two individuals that stuck with it for 10 years. Cool! Yeah. That's great. Well, Bill, thank you again so much. I feel like mm -hmm. I have learned so much. I hope people learn cool things from watching this. I'm just really grateful for your time. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure doing it. It's always nice to pass on some of our information in a way that uh, is not just entirely technical papers so most people aren't going to see and we'll, yeah. we'll uh, learn what's here and have some appreciation for it. Yeah, story of my life. <laughs> Thanks for joining me for this adventure. If you liked this video, I'd be honored if you were willing to share it with a friend or on social media. This was a big thing for me and I would love for more people to get to learn from Dr. Cannon. In the meantime, Thanks again for being here. And also a huge special thanks to the folks who support my work on Patreon, who genuinely made this whole new kind of video possible. One way or another, I'll see you next time.